have a ticket in your hand and you walk up to get on a plane and they're like, I'm sorry, you don't have a seat. And you're like, yes I do, it says it on my ticket. Well, I told her we don't start until she gets here. So if she hadn't made it, y'all would have just been out of luck. So, <laughs> it was canceled. It was canceled. We got some good groups already going, so let's, just, let's just jump right in. Uh, go to the left because they're fixing, they're fixing that one. Yes, sir, let's go. Get in there with the rock star. Hi, I was wondering, would you like to play your sister, Cindy, if you could choose uh, your Hey, Blanche. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even have to think about it. That's it. That's it. Only. Do you think you'll have any, I guess you already know, what will there be? Maybe you think there might be any flashbacks that we see as a team? I love the fact that like, everyone thinks that I'm actually going to say something. <laughs> Would you like there to be? Would you hope for it? I mean, there's so many things in this storyline that we could go back and discover and talk about it, and that'll be too much. You know, which part of what I love about Obi-Wan is I'm going back and filling in the story where, where there's some missing time for us. You could absolutely do that. I don't write the show. I hope it happens just because it'll connect it, like you said, with Obi-Wan. So good. Yeah, you know, him and Satine. You never know. As someone who grew up whose favorite character was Boba Fett, I wasn't a boy, and though I now identify as not my very, um, I was always told your favorite can't be Boba Fett, but Mandalorians, the armor, that's for, for men. And I remember very vividly, I was 11 years old, uh, it was May 12, and I saw Boba Fett for the first time on the big screen, and I said, she's not a man, and she's a Mandalorian, and I cannot accept how that changed my life. I remember going to school the next day and I had a photo on my iPod Touch uh, of a screen cap of the show and I said, ha ha, look at this, she's a badass. So first off, thank you for bringing that world to life. Um, my question is, how did it feel when you got the call to bring Boba to live action? I remember in your view, you had said you didn't expect it. No, I mean, I honestly didn't expect it. First of all, amazing. Love that story. I grew up wanting to be Bruce Willis, and nobody told me I couldn't. So, I mean, I'm still trying to say that I'm totally moment. <laughs> it's my goal in life. <laughs> so, um, don't let anyone ever tell you you can't be anything that you want to be. So, so good grief. Um, I, you know, I, I love Bo Tan. I love her food armor. I love it. Have a problem with it, I don't care. She has boobs, we need to protect them. So um, but it was it was crazy when when you know I cornered Dave jokingly. I didn't honestly think that they were gonna put me in the Mandalorian. Come on. Like, I was like, sure. So when I got a phone call that John Fabra wanting to sit down with me, it never really occurred to me that like that's what I was meeting him for until like you know many minutes into this interview with him that I'm looking around and all of they've got all these pictures from the show on the wall and my face is on Bogotan and I was like, oh you're asking me if I want to do this? I'm sorry, what world am I living in that this is my life? I literally flipped out, I think I hit the table, I said some swear words, and then I basically started like, I felt like I was like begging for the job and they'd already offered it to me. So like, if you're one of the few actors or actresses who yeah. does both their animated and live action counterparts, and I think that's absolutely incredible. Thank you, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen usually, so, um, you know, lucked out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, hi, Emily. She, oh, no. she has been in all the Star Wars related panels all weekend. Yeah. Super fan of her hair. It's yeah. super nice to meet you. Um, she actually took my question. So oh, I'm trying to get another one. Um, what was your favorite part of playing Bo Katan? Like, just in general, I guess. Yeah, so it, it, 
it's such a cool, she's such a cool character. And for me, one of the things that I love about Bo more than anyone that I've ever played is she has very clear growth. She's evolved as a character. For, for those of you that watch Clone Wars, you know that she started out not necessarily on the right side of things. And I think that it is a very valuable lesson in forgiveness, atonement, making amends, and, you know, growing as a human being. She was, you heard Dave talk about the fact that she's much younger than people think she was in Clone Wars. So I really love the idea that she's been allowed to change in this world. Um, and so that's what I love about her. I love, I love just, I don't know, the, the fact that I grew up a Star Wars fan and to be able to like actually exist in the world still sort of is odd to me. You know what I mean? It's still really strange. Um, and so that's the coolest thing. I mean, I've been a fan of John Favreau since, I mean, Swingers is one of the best movies ever. Yeah. And so to be able to work with him and go to work and call that man my boss is a very, very cool career point for me. What do you think was the best and most challenging aspect of playing Starbuck? when I got the part, um, or at least 21 when I read the script, and I think um, we were filming the miniseries when I was 22, and um, it was, up until that point in my career, I've been acting since I was 14, but I never studied, and I just was, was very blessed in the opportunities that were presented to myself. And I felt like a fraud for a very, very long time because I didn't do all the studying that everybody else did. And I convinced myself that I, that I didn't belong where I was. <laughs> and I was filming one day with Eddie Almos, and um, my mom had, had told me before that to, to just fake it. Fake it until you believe it, because it's working. So just keep doing what you're doing. And I never felt connected to characters. I felt like I was just playing. And I was working with Eddie Almos, and we were doing the scene where she comes to him and tells him that she feels responsible for Zach's death. It's a huge scene. And, um, and Eddie pulled me aside at one point, and he said, I want you to do something for me on this next take. I want you to actually listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth and then just say what comes next to you. Then say your mind next, but really listen. And I said, okay, and he said, because if you actually showed up, you'd be really good. <laughs> and I was like, oh wow, this man just sees, completely sees through my bullshit. <laughs> so I did it. I did the take, I listened to him, because you don't do anything that any, I mean, if any tells you to do something, you do it. And. There's a moment in that scene where I walk out of the room and I covered my head because as Katie, like myself, I started sobbing as I was leaving the room because I finally, for the first time in my career, felt the pain of what my character felt. And then Eddie came out and he said, congratulations, you're now acting. I was like, oh wow. So that to me was one of the most challenging parts, was I finally learned how to be very present and connected to my characters, and she was incredibly damaged. And so I owned her almost too much, and I was incredibly tired. So I learned how to then, after that, sort of pull myself back and leave the characters at home, um, because it, it damn near killed me playing her. She was exhausting. Um, but so that was the most challenging thing, was learning to actually show up, I guess. That's it. Okay, uh, my name's Tanner, and as a uh, student filmmaker, I was, I looked into like the uh, volume that you work on in the Mandalorian set. I think it's really interesting, and I wanted to know what it's like working in that kind of environment. It's insane. So, it's like shooting on location but you're in a studio. It's so weird. So like the studio of the volume that we film on is probably like the size of this whole area, like the black curtains. 
And, um, but you're literally seeing what you're talking about. So like if a Gazanti freighter goes by, or like a TIE fighter, you're seeing them go by. It is the strangest thing I've ever experienced because as an actor, especially in sci-fi, I am, I am so good at acting with tennis balls, y'all. <laughs> like uh, my tennis ball acting is on point. <laughs> um, but you don't have to do that in Star Wars. So it's so weird to like not have to use your imagination they've given it to you in the volume. It just like, it blows my mind. It's one of the coolest experiences. There's, um, notoriously, there's there's the scene in season two where we're standing on top of the razor crest and it's floating on water. And they had to literally hook us all to it because we were getting seasick and they thought we were gonna fall off. It was, and it's not moving. The only thing moving is the screens. And it's just the up and down of the water and you're standing on this thing two in the morning and all of a sudden you're like, why am I? And they're like, whoa, she's going. <laughs> it's crazy. It's really, really cool. It's really cool. I hope you get the, the opportunity to see it somebody else. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for